This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Pensacola State Today. I'm your host, Drexel Gilbert, and I'm so pleased that you're spending this time with us. Coming up on Pensacola State Today, PSC President Dr. Ed Meadows joins us in the studio. The new school year brings with it lots of exciting news that will positively impact both students and the community. We'll talk about those things. You know, art isn't always found in indoor galleries. On the campus of Pensacola State, you can step outside for a larger-than-life view of a Dutch masterpiece. And more improvements in workforce development as PSC works harder to prepare students for IT and manufacturing careers. First on Pensacola State today, the new academic year is underway at PSC, and with the new school year come some new and exciting announcements that will have a positive impact on both the student population and the community. And here to talk more about that is PSC President Dr. Ed Meadows, and as always, a warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you, Drexel. I'm glad to be here with you today. Okay, off and running on a brand new school year. Got it started. Okay, let's talk first about um, this partnership that I've heard about with the ARC Gateway. What's, what's that about, and what is going to be happening with it? We were very fortunate that the legislature uh, approved a uh, $2 million a year recurring allocation to Art Gateway to form the partnership with Pensacola State College. Uh, for example, there, what Art Gateway does now uh, in um, the intellectually disabled world is uh, they have a greenhouse, for example, and their nonprofit, and what they try to do uh, purely through donations uh, heretofore has been to address this tremendous need in our community to um, help those intellectually challenged or disabled citizens become productive citizens and taxpayers and be able to live independently. And this $2 million reoccurring allocation is going to allow them to partner with Pensacola State so that we can formally address that problem. Uh, for, for, for example, almost a thousand in, intellectually um, disabled uh, participants with Art Gateway are waiting for an opportunity to be self-sufficient and employed and employable. So through the grant, uh, we will hire uh, faculty and advisors and counselors and set up a curriculum to help these individuals uh, be mainstreamed as much as they can be into society with soft skill training and also technical skill training in certain level vocational areas. Uh, in Escambia and Santa Rosa counties that will allow them to be employable and independent living. So it's a wonderful opportunity for us to partner with a, a fantastic organization and uh, to help us expand our mission uh, for all citizens, including the intellectually disabled. Win-win all the way around. That's exactly right. Okay, let's to move on to another topic. Uh, Pensacola State College recently received a very nice gift, and I know that uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Well, it was a fabulous gift, and 18 years ago, we got that identical uh, gift by the same three families, and so now, 18 years later, uh, the Switzers, Rileys, and Lamar families have come together and. Um, donated another million dollars, which is a fabulous donation, mm -hmm. of which the college will match uh, to build a facility to expand our visual arts program. So Bobby and Charlie and John were on hand last week uh, to uh, present the check, the symbolic check, and um, they, they have a love of the arts and they have a love of Pensacola State College, and I know you'll be hearing much more from Chris Lynn about this in the future. Yeah, and later on this program, as a matter of fact. So that's great. That That's really a, a wonderful, as you say, fabulous gift. Another gift of sorts that we can talk about is the Fellows Memorial Fund. And this is um, this is something that's important to a lot of students. Let's talk about why. Uh, many years ago, uh, Dr. Earl Fellows <clears throat> had a lifetime of medical service to this community. Uh, as a medical doctor, and upon his death, uh, there was established a foundation 
whereby he um, set up a, um, a foundation which has a, a, uh, a board of trustees and Pensacola State has been involved ever since uh, it was established where the president of the Pensacola State actually uh, is a consultant to this group and we provide staffing for that uh, for a very nominal fee uh, and office space. Um, but it is a loan scholarship program and those eligible are uh, residents of Escambia, Santa Rosa, Okaloosa, and Walton counties. And uh, if they are going to uh, go to college to become a uh, medical doctor, if they're going to become a nurse or nurse practitioner, or uh, get an associate degree in some of the other health science programs, uh, or if you're going into the ministry, uh, then those individuals are eligible to apply for these loan scholarships. It is an interest-free loan, uh, and it can pay virtually for 100% of your education and training. And there is a loan forgiveness program, which would make it a scholarship if you return back uh, to the four-county area and practice in a rural area. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a fabulous opportunity. We've got to have a website um, that you can go to. It's the Fellows Fund website and we have a link uh, to that website from our Pensacola State website as well. What uh, a fabulous opportunity for students as you say in the, in the medical field, medical doctor, nurse, nurse practitioner or in the field of ministry. Right or, or in, and also in some other health science areas. Okay. Um, so uh, wonderful opportunity for our citizens in Northwest Florida and Virginia Santonia is the assistant to this program and she's housed in our library and if you call the general uh, Pensacola State switchboard, you can go into her voicemail or get her on the telephone, uh, or you can um, look her up on the web page. There's an email address there. It lists who the board of directors are, and um, we uh, we have uh, sufficient funds to give many more loans. So uh, all we need are qualified applicants. Are you listening? Do you hear me? <laughs> or do you hear Dr. <laughs> Meadows, that is? Now, we are just about out of time, but I wanted to touch briefly on the Friends of the Performing Arts, and we'll get more into that in a later program, but let's talk just real quickly about that. Uh, we've established the Friends of the Performing Arts uh, just as we've had the uh, Anna Society for Visual Arts, and uh, this was jump-started by the Winton Marsalis uh, concert where we raised uh, a little over $100,000 for performing arts. But there are sponsorship levels if you want to become involved in Friends of the Performing Arts. And we have a brochure now and we have it up on our website. So uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to become uh, more involved in the performing arts at Pensacola State College. Okay, well, Dr. Meadows, thank you so much for joining us. And I look forward to our conversation next time around. And I as well. All right, thank you. Still to come on Pensacola State Today, preparing students for in-demand careers in internet technology and manufacturing. Exciting news about that is headed your way, but first, a look ahead to events coming to the PSC campus. Welcome back. The Chamber of Commerce recently released a labor market analysis for the fields of IT and manufacturing. Joining us in the studio now to discuss the ways Pensacola State College is addressing the recommendations and the needs is Dan Bussey, who is Dean of Workforce Education, and Danny Steele, Director of Applied Technology and Professional Service Careers. And gentlemen, welcome to the studios today. Thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> well, an interesting study, and I know a great deal of thought has been put into the way that the college is going to respond to it. So talk to me a little bit about how PSC is addressing the Chamber's uh, findings and recommendations. Well, first of all, this is not something new. We have been working with our Chamber partners and our business partners on a regular basis. So the results of the, uh, the study were fairly um, known to us before it was actually published. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we are looking at that and we're trying to figure out ways to capitalize on the assets that we already have in place in order to, if you will, grab the low-hanging fruit. So that's one of the things that uh, we're looking at. How can we adjust and adapt to current programs to meet those specific needs? Um, 
I'll turn it over to Danny here for just a second concerning some of the manufacturing initiatives that we are uh, uh, going after. We, we were really, really fortunate to be involved in the process of data collection, et cetera. And uh, from my perspective, the ability to be able to communicate directly with the individuals in industry, hear their needs, hear what it is that we needed at Pensacola State College to be doing to address their needs uh, was really enlightening and really fulfilling for me. Uh, for the most part, it's something that by them compiling this and putting it together becomes a tool for us as uh, program coordinators, directors, and um, improvers, if you would. Uh, it gives us something to focus on in order to make our programs what industry needs. So it's a, an excellent analysis. All right. And, you know, this is another example throughout the months that we've been, been um, putting Pensacola State today out on WSRA TV. Uh, we've talked about the partnership between the college and community, and this is just another great example of how the industry industry leaders and the, and the college really do work together for the best interest of not just of the students but of the community at large too. Correct. So tell me a little bit about the programs, the new programs that may come out of this or that are coming out of this. Well, what we're looking at is some of the results, we'll take manufacturing first, uh, some of the results, specifically the needs that are, are in demand right now. One of them is called a P-TECH program, a process technology. We've already done some of the preliminary research in order to uh, uh, bring that program here. It is fairly expensive but there's still a, few, uh, a fairly large demand, so we're putting our resources behind that. The other thing that we've done in order to expand the programs that we currently offer is we're making purchasing decisions on equipment, trainers, supplies, that type of thing, to address those specific needs. One of them, again, is something called a PLC. We've uh, added additional PLC trainers. That stands for Program Logical logic controllers. Mm -hmm. Those are used in our industrial setting on a regular basis for nearly all the manufacturers across the, uh, uh, the area. So we're looking to, like I said before, to provide the uh, skill set that individuals need to walk into the workplace as entry-level employees. And they will get that right here on this campus. Absolutely. Okay. One, one of the interesting things when we began this interaction with industry is I also found that industry didn't know the products we were putting out. They didn't know the quality and the skills that our students had that were graduating currently from our programs. So it was enlightening two ways. We were able to tell them process control, for example, we're 90 percent there. We've got a little bit more to go, but we're 90 percent there. Mm -hmm. So we really are to a large extent. And I will say this, filling the needs, to, I will say this, I just talked to a student day before yesterday that just took a job, I'm not going to say where, but locally, uh, a CIT graduate from an IT program, $80,000 a year start. And, and that was impressive. So, so significant. That, that is very yeah. impressive, significant, yeah. great yeah. adjectives right. to right. use for that. It Welcome. doesn't just change that particular student's life, it changes his entire family tree Absol <laughs> going forward. Absolutely. Speaking of great adjectives, another one is comprehensive. And there is a comprehensive approach to this. And we talked about, uh, talk to me a little bit about some of the hiring that, that is mentioned here. Well, one of the things that we're looking for in our uh, instructor pool is individuals who have the relative uh, industry certifications as well as being experts. We don't want just somebody who is learning to be an instructor. We are looking for individuals who have the skill set that is in high demand. An example, we just hired a plumbing instructor. Not only is he a master plumber, but he has some very specific skills related to industrial pipe fitting. So that very nicely fits in with one of the recommendations in that uh, market analysis. So we are being very methodical when we hire individuals to teach these courses. Students can rest assured that the person that we put in front of them as an instructor has the skills that are absolutely needed. They're experts in their field. That's what we're looking for. That's what we base our programs on, that high-quality instructor delivering the content. Okay. Anything to add on that, Danny? We encourage our instructors, all of them, to hold hands with industry, to tighten those connections, to arrange for uh, field trips, et cetera, and it's worked out very well for the student's benefit. When, I was just going to say, what, often um, our instructors will get calls from the HR departments of these various companies. Who do you have that's ready to graduate that you can recommend? So that's one of the connections that, uh, that we have, that direct link between our instructor, our program, and the businesses that they're feeding. Okay. And the last question I think that we're going to get to now is how are we meeting the short-term needs with the corporate and professional training activities? We have an entire department whose sole function is to provide individuals with training who are currently employed, that corporate and professional development. Um, those programs, we specifically have interactions and we have a needs assessment for what the business needs and then we develop a customized program for it. A fairly large manufacturer in the chemical arena uh, just uh, contract it with the college in order to deliver uh, a training program for the individuals that they have just hired, mm -hmm. so that inbound training. It included things like uh, safety, basic electricity, um, troubleshooting, valves and pumps, uh, process control, 
uh, catalysts. So the customized training was delivered by a former Ford engineer. So again, even in that customized world, we are providing the instructors for the companies that have the industry expertise and the pedigree, if you will, to deliver that content in a in a fashion that's not only relative, uh, relative, but it's also cost effective for the companies. That's why they're coming to us to contract for that training. Okay, any last words from you, Danny, before we wrap this I one up? I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit more about Pensacola State, what we're doing in it, and obviously we could spend a lot more time doing this. Thank well, you. we could, and you know what I'd like to do is check back with you guys in a few months, and let's do a progress report and see how things are moving along, because it's very exciting. Absolutely, thank right. you. Thank you very much. Right now, a look ahead to some of the events headed to Pensacola State College. And when we return, exciting things ahead for the PSC Visual Arts Program and the community as well. And art heads to the great outdoors at PSC in a really big way. Welcome back. The visual arts program at Pensacola State College consistently produces some of the finest student work and the finest showings of art ranging from paintings to sculpture and photography and more. The program's taken a giant leap forward, you might say, with the addition of what may be the first of its kind outdoor art gallery and with a $1 million gift from a local family. Here to talk more about this with us is PSC Visual Arts Department Head Chris Lynn. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Well, let's talk first about the outdoor art gallery. What an idea and a concept, but this is not something that happened just overnight. No, we've actually been talking about it for a couple of years, a little more than two years now. Um, and actually several artists who have come through and have been exhibiting have been excited about the possibility of even being able to participate in it. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a while to figure out how to actually put the things on the buildings outside. Um, because we're talking 20, the first one is 20 by 15 and a half feet. The second one going up is going to be 22 feet wide, so they're really large pieces. And securing them to the building so that they don't do any damage to the building or to anything else is was a work. Yeah. Well, let's back up for a minute. So describe for us, for those who may not have seen this, and they're about to see video of it, or maybe they already have, it's mm -hmm. up on the screen now, but t tell us what this outdoor art gallery is all about. Well, we just thought it'd be a great idea to help make Pensacola State another a, a destination, a place to come not only for classes and, and the, the things that we're known for, but for the community to have some another reason to come by here. So what we've started is we're actually taking, reproducing famous works of art and doing them on a very large scale and putting them on the sides of buildings and they'll stay up probably a year or more. Um, and so we're, we're on our second one about to, to be installed and we're gonna do several of these. So, you know, eventually, hopefully, we'll even move them to other campuses around and, and do that too. What's the caliber of the artwork we will be seeing? Uh, the first one is, uh, you may have already seen it on the video, is John Vermeer. It's a uh, girl with a pearl earring, which a lot of people know, and that's kind of why we chose that, because it was a familiar piece. Mm -hmm. The second one that is about to, is being printed now, and hopefully will go up soon, is uh, one of Steve McCurry's, who it, the, his exhibition is up now there, and we have the, the talk at the Sanger coming up. Um, it's going to be um, Boy in Mid-Flight, very colorful piece of a boy running down a, an alley that's kind of a blue-colored, mm -hmm. very Moroccan-looking um, kind of uh, a place. And that's going to be uh, on the side, on 9th Avenue side of the of building for the English building. Okay. Now, how complicated is this process to take this work of art and blow it up, if you will, to, to this, this size. And then, and I understand, though, that when you get close to it, you really can see a lot of detail. It's amazing. The, 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 the printing facility, it's printed by um, Lamar Advertising, um, which we just provide a high-resolution image for them, and they actually print it. Their printer, it's, for lack of a better description, it looks like a giant inkjet printer, only it just, it runs, you know, 15 feet and 15 feet back and however long the vinyl is um, that it's printed on. But the, the technology is such that when you get up close to these, there is no pixelation, which is amazing. 
And what does this do for the community in terms of taking the art to them? Well, it, it's a combination of things. I mean, the, the idea is, like I say, to bring art out to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, people who may not have ever seen these things and, and may not take the time to come into our gallery and see an exhibition or, or any other museum or gallery. A lot of people just don't have the time or don't even know why they should go in there. So hopefully seeing some of these and making it on a more accessible uh, you know, way of seeing things like that hopefully will will spawn an interest in people to go see these. Plus we just thought, you know, we've got a lot of brick sides on our buildings mm -hmm. and it's just a very good way to kind of make them look better, you know, if you will. And again, we thought it would just be a great attraction for the community to another reason to come and see what we do here. It'll be interesting to see how many colleges uh, follow your lead in this because I think it's a great concept. Let's switch gears now. And Dr. Meadows was on a little earlier and talked about a fabulous gift um, to the visual arts department. And I wanted you to elaborate a little bit about that. Of course, it's the $1 million gift that uh, that comes from the Switzer and the Lamar and Riley families, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This this is, and they have, um, the building, uh, our, the art building is named the Anna Lamar Switzer Center for Visual Arts, and that was done um, 18 years ago after she passed away. Um, they noda donated a million dollars to the college in, in honor of her name, and subsequently the building was named after her. Mm -hmm. And then now, 18 years later, they have come back around, and the three families have gotten together and decided to do this again, which is just fabulous for us because we are currently in dire need of more space. We've gotten to the point, our programs have grown where we literally are running out of room. Okay. Well, that's a good thing. It's a very good You're thing. You're growing. So what what can we expect to see happen then following this gift? Well, there's well, there's a million dollar gift from the Switzer Riley Lamar families and then uh, the college has actually uh, matched that with another million dollars. Now we're kicking off a capital campaign where we hope to raise at least another million dollars. Um, there's going to be a, it's going to be called the Lamar Studio, it's going to be a, um, for lack of a better word, a museum, but we don't, museum usually shows dead artists and for the most part, and we always show live artists, so okay. it's going to be called the Lamar Studio, and it's going to be a, a, a much larger um, venue for our lectures and that, because we have completely outgrown what we have now. It's going to also be a place to house our permanent collection that the college owns, and uh, a place to display you know, other exhibitions. The nice thing about it is this will be a secure spot so that we can bring in a higher caliber of shows that we have not been able to bring in before because our, our current gallery that we use and will continue to use is also the heart of our, our studios and our classrooms. And so it's really difficult to have secured shows in there because you know, our gallery is the focal point. It, every time you come out of one of the, the studios or the lecture halls, you're in the gallery. So this will be a separate gallery that can be more secured and, and better security for, like say, higher caliber shows that we hope to bring in. Okay, great. Before we go, we're just about out of time, but I wanted to touch a bit on the students in the visual arts department. It's a growing department, and talk to me about the caliber of the students that you have and where they're, maybe where this is taking them in their careers down the road. They're getting a great education here. They are, and, and in fact, one of the, the great points as we were looking back with this new gift is we realized that from the time of the first gift, from the Switzer Riley Lamar families to now that our student population in the visual arts the number of majors has grown 142 percent. That's that's tremendous. Yes. In 18 years, um, we our students are now as you know we offer the bachelor's degree in graphic design. Our students are going. Um, some of them leave and go to other schools. Uh, many of them now are staying around for the bachelor's and getting really good jobs, um, which is a really nice. Um, feeling for us because a lot of these students used to have to leave here to go off to some of the private schools or the other art schools to finish up and now we've kind of brought it full circle where we're actually offering the bachelor's degree so it's really keeping some of the talent at home now that used to go off. Isn't that wonderful? It's a good feeling, it really is. All right, Chris Lynn, thank you so much for being with us. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. And when we return, teachers who are recognized for their excellence in the classroom.
Earlier this year, six PSC teachers were honored for their excellence in the classroom. In previous editions of Pensacola State Today, we met four of those instructors. This time, we meet the final two, Chad Smoody and Paula Work. Different differential equations, right? When you get somebody to understand something or to see how something can be applied, or you're up there showing them these formulas, these equations, and you hear somebody say, oh, that's cool. That's it. You're done. You're sold. See, that'll make anybody look cool, won't it? I really enjoy it. I mean, it's, you have, like in this differential equations class, you have 30 students in here, and you know each and every 20 years down the road, you go and you look and you see the projects that they work on. Uh, the other day we were volunteering at a math competition for middle school kids, and I ran across a student I had seven years ago in calculus, and he's now a, a civil engineer in town. So it's just, it's amazing, you know, and I, you know it takes time for this to catch up, but you don't realize how fast it comes. X to the N minus two. I could teach you how to use a saw to saw a piece of wood. I could teach you how to use a hammer to uh, put in a nail. Um, but if I never show you or you never go far enough to learn that this can be used to put walls together or build forms for concrete forms or build anything else, then all you realize is that these are tools and, and boy that was a lot of fun, you know, just hammering and sawing and I learned how to use them and that's all you have but uh, there is more to it. They work so hard. The effort that they put in is basically what I'm riding on. As soon as you start to show somebody how that math can be applied to their world, when you start showing that to, the, to people, you uh, get addicted to it. What are you using to come up with this? Is that burnt sienna? If you're an artist, I don't feel that it's a choice that you make. If you decide to act on it or not, that's the choice. And so I have people coming in here with some aspiring to do something with their lives and they have that, you know, we're kind of kindred spirits. So that's a really great thing to me. I feel that I need to nurture that inner artist. I'm just helping people unlock what's in them, you know, like it's, it's their thing. Everyone, almost all of them across the board, need to be taught how to produce, you know, because if you're not um, making any art, you're not really an artist. So there's some practical things. They need to find themselves and find what makes them want to produce, because just the talent by itself isn't enough. I grew up drawing and making Things. I mean, I've just have always been an artist and I didn't know how I did it, I just did it. But the teaching has been a whole nother education for me and that's what I enjoy about it is that it's, um, it continues, it's not stagnant. Every semester I get a new group of people coming in with some idea that, you know, there's a goal that they wanna, they wanna get to and to be involved with that and helping them towards that is what keeps me going. And that's going to do it for this edition of Pensacola State Today. I'm Drexel Gilbert. We're so pleased that you've spent this time with us. Take care, and we'll see you next time.